Hello, this is Brian Auten of Apologetics 315. Today I am speaking with Clay Jones, Assistant Professor at the Master of Arts in Christian Apologetics at Biola University, and he teaches courses in Theodicy and the Issue of Evil, Apologetics Research and Writing, and Defending the Resurrection. But the area of focus he is known for is the topic of evil and suffering. His forthcoming publications include some contributions on the topics of theodicy, evil, and suffering in the Encyclopedia of Christian Civilization from Wiley Blackwell in 2010, as well as his own forthcoming work, Why God Allows Evil. The purpose of our interview today is to learn a little bit more about Clay's ministry, his work, and to discuss the topics of evil and suffering and how they relate to the work of the Christian apologist. So thanks for taking the time to speak with me today, Clay. My pleasure, Brian. Now, uh, could you tell our listeners a bit more about yourself? Uh, I came to uh, the world in a strange family. Uh, my father, growing up, was an agnostic, and my mother was an astrologer, and together we attended the United Methodist Church. And when I say that my father was an agnostic, I mean, he was an educated man. He was, an, as a matter of fact, he was an educator. He'd become the superintendent of a couple of school districts. He thought that religion was largely just a bunch of baloney. Uh, and when I say my mother was an astrologer, I don't mean that she read our chart in the paper and told us about, hey, this is what the paper says. I mean, she had graphs and charts and would tell us things like your moon is in the seventh house and Jupiter's aligned with Mars and, and what this means for your life. And she taught, taught me to read a, uh, you know, do palm reading, read a Ouija board, use a Ouija board, uh, took me to Buddhist temples. And, you know, so I got this weird, I was raised in this weird milieu of, having a father who thought this is nonsense and was really more of an atheist, a kind of a playboy womanizing kind of guy and thought that this religious experience was largely just a bunch of baloney. My mother, who was into anything and everything religious, and like I say, we attended in strangely the United Methodist Church where the pastor didn't believe there you could be born again or anything really, that you could really know anything about God. And I thought that was, it was just such a bizarre upbringing. My father, thankfully, when I was about 13 years old, came to Christ and gave up his womanizing and and uh, gave up, obviously, all of his, the, the things that he was doing that was really sinful. My, fa my mother then soon followed and gave up all of her occultic things. I became a Christian right after that, too, because the change in my father's life especially was so dramatic. But I think that this really had a tremendous effect on my interest in Christian apologetics because I've had the occult on one side and, and all religious experiences faults on the other. And uh, all of a sudden to go, well, you know what? Christianity is true. Well, I wanted immediately to know the basis for why it was true. So that was kind of the way I was brought up. And, and it uh, obviously, as you can imagine, had a pretty profound impact on me. Now, after you got into apologetics, what made you focus on the subject of the problem of evil then? You know, it's it's interesting. I, I think I came to the problem of evil exactly backwards. I think most people come to the problem of evil because they go, Kai, why is there all this suffering? Look at all these terrible things that are happening. We've got to figure out how God can answer this. Uh, like I said, I came to it backwards. For years, I started studying, began to realize the glory that awaits us in heaven, the wonder and privilege of what it meant to be a Christian that we're not just forgiven of our sins and given eternal life, but we've been adopted into his family. Uh, we are for going to be glorified with him. The scripture even says that we're going to reign with Christ in uh, heaven forever and ever. Revelation 22, 5 says, and they will reign forever and ever. Uh, it, but So I was just struck. And for so long, I read about all the wonderful things. And I just, it was the only thing I really wanted to study for several years was the glory that awaits us when Jesus returns. But as I was studying that, it just seemed like a natural thing to me to begin to study where I'd come from. And by that, I mean the depths of sin and what was my life like before I was a Christian. Uh, so I began to study the horror of humankind without God. And I really began to get a new perspective on the problem of evil. 
I think, as a matter of fact, the, the famous Bible expositor of Westminster Chapel, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, got it exactly right when he put it this way. He said, most of our troubles are due to the fact that we're guilty of a double failure. We fail on the one hand to realize the depth of sin, and on the other hand, we fail to realize the greatness and the height and the glory of our salvation. I think that's exactly correct. And in my opinion, those two things right there, we fail to understand the depths of sin and we fail to realize the glory, the greatness, the height of our salvation are the two major problems facing the average Christian today, regardless of apologetics or not. Those are the two major problems facing the Christian. Hmm. But so as I, as the years went on, and I began to study these in more and more detail, uh, the depths out of which God had called us and the heights that, that he called us to. Honestly, and this may uh, shock some people or surprise some people, honestly, the problem of evil started to go away. And so then I thought, well, wait a minute here. I think these two facets of Christian truth, that we are born depraved sinners from Adam, and that God has forgiven us, and he's going to draw us up to be in heaven with him forever and ever, and glorify us, and that we're going to reign with him, that as I began to see these things, I thought, well, this answers, this largely answers much of the problem of evil. Mm -hmm. And so I just began to really then, there came a point in my life where I said, you know, let's look at these, at the problem of evil specifically and clearly with these two things in view. And I think that's what primarily got me uh, started in the topic. Mm -hmm. Now, I do want to explore this subject in a, little, in a little more depth, seeing that you're a specialist in this area. But before we go too far, for those people who may be a little bit more new to the subject, could you define the so-called problem of evil and kind of give an overview of what the challenge is in a nutshell? Sure. The problem of evil, first there's a syllogistic form for the problem of evil, and it goes something like this. If God is all good, he would desire to prevent evil. And if he's all powerful, he'd be able to prevent evil. But evil exists. Therefore, either God isn't all good or he's not all powerful or uh, he doesn't exist at all. One of those three. That's the syllogistic uh, problem of evil. Most people, however, the more popular version runs like this. Why do bad things happen to good people? That's how most people are going, God, why are those bad things happening to those good people? And, and so the problem is, how do we explain all of the evil and all of the suffering that we encounter in this world, which, of course, is humongous, to say the least? How do we account for this? Why does God allow all of this to go on? How is it possible that God could allow children to die of cancer or women to be raped or people to be tortured to death? How is that possible? And so we begin to say, how, you know, explain to me why God allows this. And that, anyway, that essentially is the problem of evil in a nutshell. Yeah. For those people who are getting into studying this topic or they want resources that are going to help them kind of explore it, are there any particular books or authors that uh, do you think have written, say, definitive works in the area, kind of must-read books? Well, from a technical standpoint, uh, I would suggest The Many Faces of Evil by John Feinberg. However, I've got to warn you, that is really not easy reading. Uh, in fact, it's very difficult reading, so I don't think most people are going to turn to it. We assign that book, I assign that book for my master's students, and believe me, there's chapters in it that are really a struggle for them because you're really reading the highest level of discourse on why God allows evil. I think it's a fine book, and that's why I assign it, but uh, that's more on the technical level. For the not-so-technical, there is the, even though it's not-so-technical, wonderful and fabulous, and I'm sure many of your listeners uh, would be aware of it, is C.S. Lewis's The Problem of Pain. That is my personal favorite, although it's a little dated because in one chapter, uh, Lewis talks about theistic evolution, and that turns some people off. Well, that's all he knew then. But anyway, that, that, that turns some people off. By the way, later in his life, he realized that even that was nonsense. But he, back in 1947, that he didn't have a better answer. Anyway, 
he talks about theistic evolution in one chapter, uh, but after that, the rest of the book is absolutely fabulous. I think Lewis had the best grasp on heaven of anyone I know, period. And, and I've never read better literature on heaven than what Lewis has written. And also, Lewis really understands the significance of human evil and how that rates, relates to theodicy. Uh, for instance, he wrote a book, that, one of the last books he wrote in his life was Till We Have Faces. Lewis said that that was his favorite of his own works. But surprisingly, when I talk to Christians, very few of them have ever read Till We Have Faces. But Till We Have Faces is a theodicy. Uh, the the protagonist starts out, I'm not going to give the whole plot away, but the prota I hope people read it, but the protagonist, the protagonist starts out with a complaint against God, and that is what the whole book is about, is she is complaining against God for how unfairly he's treated her and how good she has been and how she hasn't deserved all the suffering that has occurred to her. Well, at the end of the book, uh, she is able to actually make her complaint to God but as she's making her complaint, her own heart was revealed to her and the selfishness of her own heart and how these actions that she had presented, at least in her own mind, as being totally good and selfless were really evil. And when she was done reading her own complaint with a revelation of her heart, the God says to her, do you have your answer? And she said, yes. And that was... <laughs> That was the end of her, her her talking to the gods. The gods didn't say anything more to her than just simply give her an opportunity to have her own heart revealed to her. Hmm. And I think that's exactly, uh, again, what we need. It's one of the two things that I mentioned. We need to understand human sinfulness. So I really, uh, the book goes on from there, by the way, but I really recommend, if you want to read a good theodicy about human evil and how human evil relates to the problem of evil, I think the Till We Have Faces is, is great. I think The Great Divorce, which uh, by C.S. Lewis again, I think it gives us some insight into hell. Obviously, it's done in a very lighthearted manner, but I agree with most people. I think that the occupants of hell are unrepentant. Uh, I think that uh, James, what is it, Ernest Henley, who said, it matters not how straight the gate nor charged with punishments the scroll for I'm the master of my fate, and I'm the captain of my soul. I think that really describes the occupants of hell, that they don't want, they don't want to be with God. Oh, they, don't get me wrong, as Lewis points out, they don't want to be in hell either. It's just they don't want to be in a place where God is in ultimate control. And then for anybody who is hurting, I would recommend the book by uh, Johnny Erickson Tata, When God Weeps. That is really good book. There's a lot, actually the second half. There's a lot of theology to it. She wrote, co-wrote it with somebody, uh, but it keeps an eye on heaven, which again I can't emphasize enough. I think is absolutely essential. It keeps an eye on heaven while helping people deal with suffering. Mm -hmm. So those are. I mean, I could go on, but I think those are the key books that. If you said, can you just give me something to read on this to get started? Those are the key books that I would start with. That's what I'm looking for. And for those people who are also new to the subject, define theodicy for them uh, right. as it relates to this issue of evil. Sure. We use two terms, essentially, when we're talking about God, why God allows evil. One of them is just the larger, the problem of evil. And when we're talking about the problem of evil, most, most of the time people will offer what they call a defense. A defense is just a reason as to why God might allow evil. In other words, it doesn't even necessarily have to be the real answer, but it is an answer that will suffice to get God off the hook for evil. Uh, and for instance, one of the defenses is the free will defense, that God wanted to create beings with free will. And uh, when he did that, uh, you can't create beings with free will and not allow them to use it wrongly. But anyway, so a defense is just simply to say, here's a possible reason why God might disallow evil. On the other hand, most of the time when we use the word theodicy, although they're sometimes used interchangeably and you have to be aware of that, but when we use the word theodicy, we mean it more as an explanation of God's real reasons for why he allows all the evil that is in the world. Uh, the word theodicy was coined by uh, Leibniz, who said, who, who took the two words theos for God 
and DK for justice and put them together. And so you had theodicy, which means the justice of God, or when really, in, when we're talking about this, the justification of why God would allow all the evil that is in the world. So I would just emphasize the theodicy and the problem of evil are words that are used interchangeably often. But when we use, when I use the Odyssey, often anyway, I, 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 depending on who I'm, whom I'm talking to, I mean it as God's real reasons for allowing all the evil that He allows in the world. Great. That leads into the next question. Now, as a specialist in the area, what do you see are the main approaches that are taken in response to the problem of evil? Well, I, I most the Odysseys basically boiled down to what we call the greater good defense, namely that it was a greater good for God to allow evil than not to allow all evil, that God wants to do certain things in the universe and that he can't accomplish these things without allowing all evil. And that makes me think I need to explain something else right off the bat. As Christians, we do not believe that God can do contradictory things. We do not believe that even God can make square circles or colorless red cars uh, and this kind of thing, things that are definitionally impossible. We do not believe, therefore, also that God, for instance, can give creatures free will and never allow any of them to use it wrongly. But that's simply a contradiction, a logical contradiction. So when we say God can do all things, we do not mean that God can do things that are logically contradictory. That would just simply be false. Uh, so when it comes to the greater good defense, as I mentioned, the very first one of the greater goods is free will. Namely, uh, God considered that giving his creatures free will was a greater good than not allowing any evil. I certainly think this is much of the reason evil and suffering exists in our world. Uh, after all, uh, it's logically impossible to give beings free will and to prevent them from using it wrongly. And I, I can't emphasize that enough. This is as logically clear as it can get. You can't give beings free will and at the same time say you can't use it wrongly because you then have not given the beings free will. This is as logical as it gets. Nobody uh, can really disagree with this. Not even God can create a morally free being at the sa and at the same time not let them, him or her use it morally wrongly. That wouldn't be freedom at all. Mm -hmm. So free will is an incredibly, incredibly valuable thing, too. I think people, if you talk to the average man or woman on the street, and you say, why did God allow evil? Uh, usually, if they're not skeptics or atheists, usually they'll say something like this. Well, because God wanted to create beings with free will. But I don't think that many of them find this terribly compelling. And the reason I think they don't is because they really haven't thought through the significance of what free will is about. And what I would encourage them to do, all of us to do, is to think through some of the science fiction movies, actually, that have come out. I don't net recommend that people watch all of them because some of them are not fit for Christians to watch. But over the years, when I was uh, maybe a little less discerning, I did. But uh, nobody wants to be surrounded by robots, regardless of how real looking they are. And let me give you a couple of examples, for instance. Uh, one of my favorite science fiction movies uh, it was the, the, the first Matrix a tremendous movie, and the Terminator, Terminator series, too, were movies about free will. They have the theme of humans create robot or computer, and you'll see many movies like this. Humans create robot slash computer. The robot or computer becomes self-aware, that is, it gains free will, and then the robot or computer then spends the rest of the time trying to destroy humans. <laughs> This is, you know, that the, the robot gets free will or computer, and then the robot starts to use the free will to destroy humankind or to somehow inhibit or farm them or hinder them or something. That's, a, that's, that's how, so those movies are about free will. Another type of free will sci-fi movie genre is something that tries to take our free will away from us. Uh, even often for the purpose of giving us, uh, utopia. There's been several movies, several, several versions, I should say, of the invasion of the body snatchers. It's been made four times now. The night I encourage by if you want to see a clean movie that illustrates this, see the nineteen fifty six version of the invasion of the body snatchers. Uh but it it was remade again recently with Nicole Kidman. It was just entitled Invasion. But this movie is about basically aliens uh 
taking over human bodies and the humans no longer feel pain or they no longer feel remorse. They no longer feel grief, but neither do they laugh. Neither, you know, babies don't cry, but babies don't laugh or smile. And so the humans, of course, are desperately interested in what they're doing is they're fighting these aliens that are trying to take over what their their very free will and they spend the rest of the movie what trying to kill uh the, whatever entity is trying to take them over the movie the stepford wives which has been made twice now and i think it's interesting just to see how often these movies are being made that they're making them again the second version not as chilling as the first but basically the idea again would i be better off with a wife that was a robot well, that's dumb. I mean, nobody really wants a robot wife. Uh, I don't care how realistic they look. I mean, a robot wife is just three steps above inflatable. And I, I think people realize that. But again, I emphasize because I think it's so important. These movies are picking up a theme. And you'll find this even with the movie WALL-E and iRobot on who's going to be in control of our lives. Uh, are, is a computer going to be in control of our lives? Or are we going to be in control of our lives? And what do we do about it? So, so I think the first theme is free will. And free will is valuable. And I just cannot emphasize that enough. Uh, God could have populated the world with otters. They're fun, you know. Uh, or he could have populated the world with golden retrievers because they could sit there and look at you and pant happily away. But God wanted to create significant beings, and that's where we came from. So anyway, I'm going a little long here, but just let me say, so the first thing is free will. I, the second thing that I think is the, the biggest theme, the other great greater good defense is usually about soul building, that namely God is working to make us better individuals, not just for here on earth, but forever and ever. I think that's also true. I think that's exactly what he's doing here. In addition to having us become significantly free beings, he also wants to teach us lessons that are good for all of eternity. Uh, the lessons we learn here prepare us so that he can set us free in his kingdom to reign with him forever and ever. To prepare us to reign, however, that means that he has to allow us uh, to learn the lessons of suffering and evil now. And so my contention is that earth is really, this earth is really boot camp. And so, I, again, I would add one more time, I think one of the biggest lacks in theodicy in general is that in the, and in the Christian teaching is that we're not spending enough time talking about the wonder of eternity. We're going to live forever and ever. Somebody has said, I don't remember who, that eternity in heaven dwarfs our suffering here to insignificance. And I just encourage anybody that happens to listen to this to really think that through. If we're really going to live forever and ever and ever, that dwarfs our suffering here to insignificance. We need to be aware of anybody who wants to, who tries to turn eternity into the PS to the Christian life. The, the most famous verse in the Bible, in fact, ends with, shall not perish, but have eternal life. But unfortunately, I find that too many Christians are not focused on this. Uh, but if you really focus on eternal life, it makes sense of our suffering here because God gave us free will and he's preparing us to be fit citizens for his kingdom forever and ever and ever. So there's my long, my long, well, obviously this is the key, isn't it? What's the heart of this issue? And that's what you asked. There's two things. He gave us free will and he's teaching us things that will prepare us for eternity. Excellent. Great stuff. Now, when people raise the problem of evil, say an objector to Christianity, they're often, they have very strong examples that they'll use of, of evil things that have happened in the world uh, as sort of the evidential uh, weight of uh, being against God that, you know, how could God cause this? You've also got uh, different things where They'll turn the tables against God, see, well, see God himself as evil, mm -hmm. and the Old Testament God is evil. And there's all these uh, really emotionally loaded words, examples, and, and stuff, and, and not at all to downplay the importance of the question, but I want to get your perspective. Do you think that when people raise these sorts of objections that it's primarily a knowledge problem or an emotional problem, a theological problem, or do you think it's all of the above rolled into one for most people? 
I think it's largely all of the above, uh, and I, but I think the reason for that is, is I would say that feelings follow thoughts about 100% unless you've got a chemical imbalance or something else going on that feelings follow thoughts. So obviously if you think that God is unfair, well, your emotions are going to follow. That just makes sense to me. Uh, but it, but we need to be careful because sometimes it could be a theological problem or sometimes it could be, guy, I'm just hurting because my son died. Well, you know what? If somebody's just hurting recently because their son died, gee, the scripture says, weep with those who weep in Romans. And, and we need to just love them and be there for them. When somebody just has suffered a tremendous loss, the last thing they need is somebody to immediately sit down and try to make it immediately better. Here, look, the answer's right here. When really they just need somebody to love them. And so we certainly shouldn't move too quickly to... Uh, just giving them answers. But there is a time for answers, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, anyway, yeah, I, I think that for a lot of people, it does feel like it's just all rolled up into one thing. Now, um, the issue of the Canaanites is one from the Old Testament uh, that gets the most press, if you will. Um, but you've written a paper that was published in Philosophia Christi, entitled, We Don't Hate Sin, So We Don't Understand What Happened to the Canaanites, an addendum to divine genocide arguments. Could you describe basically what that issue with the Can Canaanites is and the direction that you take in the paper? Absolutely. I, I In that paper, I do three things. First, I explain what the Canaanite sin was. If you read, because people say, well, why did God order their destruction and order them being thrown out of the land? Well, we know exactly why. He tells us specifically why in Leviticus 18. And I encourage people that are wondering about this to read Leviticus 18 very carefully. What we find is when you read Leviticus 18 is that the Canaanites were committing incest, adultery. Uh, they then offered their children to Molech. By the way, so you have incestuous sins and adulterous sins, right? Those are ho those are heterosexual sins. What is hetero what do heterosexual sins produce? Well, they produce unwanted children, and so then you offer your children to Molech. Molech was a bullheaded god in whose outstretched arms uh, a baby could be placed, and in whose fire belly a fire was stoked, and so they burned the baby to death. Uh, so anyway, they were offering their children as as old as four years old to Molech. Uh, then the next thing that they committed, and this makes logical sense, the next thing the Canaanites did, well, okay, we've committed every kind of heterosexual sin there is. They started committing homosexual sin. And then once they'd done that, the last thing left was bestiality. And I go on and explain and document. We know actually a lot about their culture from extra-biblical sources. Bestiality, homosexuality, incest were commonplace in the ancient Near East. And you can see that in the Philosophia Christi article. So that's the first thing I do is just try to say, let's look at their sin and the significance of their sin. The next thing that I do is to point out that Israel was seduced exactly by them exactly because uh, they didn't do what God had commanded. Namely, God said, the only way we're going to get rid of this sin is for you to wipe it out. But they didn't wipe it out. They didn't. They just said, no, no, this is we're going to let some of these people live. And they didn't. And what then Israel began to do, read, this is what the prophets are about, by the way, is denouncing Israel for committing the sins of the Canaanites. So anyway, Israel began to commit the sins of the Canaanites. The prophets then began to warn them. Uh, first, it was really warning uh, the northern tribes called Israel and said, you better repent or you're going to be destroyed. They didn't repent. They committed the same sins as the Canaanites. So in 722, uh, they were destroyed by Assyria. Assyria came in not just and destroyed them, but depopulated uh, uh, northern Israel, took all the people and put them all over the ancient Near East, just scattered them throughout the ancient Near East. Uh, then uh, Judah, who had some righteous kings, so it wasn't so fast in its downfall, the prophets began to come to them too and began to say, um, you better repent or God's going to destroy you too. They didn't repent. And so in 586, God allowed the Babylonians under the command of Nebuchadnezzar to destroy them. And I think we need to realize this then. This is not genocide in, the, in this sense. 
God did not, God did not say, I want you just to kill the race of Canaanites. What God said was, you, you will kill those who are committing this sin. In this case, the Canaanites. Then when Israel committed the same sins, God ordered Israel to likewise be destroyed. So this is not genocide, but capital punishment. And God punished both of them equally for committing the same sins. Uh, the third thing that I do in the article and that I do whenever I talk about it is to point out that in our culture, we commit the same sins. And I don't think people have come to grips with that anywhere near enough that we are committing the same sins that the Canaanites committed. And first, adultery was rampant. Incest is looked at ever being not so significant. And by the way, I would point out to anybody, we're in a bizarre situation, which is very sad that incest itself is being challenged as not as being not that bad. Uh, and then bestiality. And you say, really, are we headed towards bestiality? Oh, certainly we are. Let me just mention this will gross people out, but not too badly. Two movies came out in the last four years about bestiality that got wider play. In other words, you think they're going to show bestiality films in some strange little, you know, video. You could get a video somewhere, maybe on the Internet. But a couple of movies have come out that were mainstream movies that were featuring bestiality. One of them was the 2007 movie Zoo. And a movie reviewer of the Los Angeles Times, in fact, on January 22nd, 2007, named Kenneth Turin, who's the major movie reviewer for the L.A. Times, put it this way. He says the title of the, his article was Zoo is not just you. But listen to what he says here. Zoo, preparing before a rapt audience Saturday night at Sundance, manages to be a poetic film about a forbidden subject, a perfect marriage between a cool and contemplative director and potentially incendiary subject matter, sex between men and animals. Not graphic in the least, this strange and strangely beautiful film combines audio interviews with allegic visual recreations intended to conjure up the mood and spirit of the situations. Yuck! I can't, I mean, yuck. And it isn't that the movie was made, because, of course, we expect people to make perverted movies. That's just the way the world's going. But it's Kenneth Turin's re saying, yeah, it's Sundance. Boy, this movie was a hit. People loved it. I'm thinking at a film festival, they thought a movie about men having sex with animals was a good thing. One more. Uh, a movie came out in 2008 called Sleeping Dogs Lie, and it's a movie about a young woman that's getting married, but before she gets engaged, she happens to have sex with her dog. I know that's gross, but this is, I think people need to realize this. Uh, when her fiancé finds out that she had, she confesses to her fiancé that she'd had sex with his dog, her fiancé breaks off the marriage. Now, listen to uh, – now, the, that a movie would be made like this, of course, is not terribly surprising because you go perverts are going to make weird movies, and that's just all there is to it. But listen to how Rolling Stone magazine reviewed the movie. said, quote, Sleeping Dogs Lie possesses a quick wit and an endearing tenderness toward Amy as honesty wrecks her life. It's sweet, doggone it, unquote. Now, think about the significance of that, that this major publication would say, you know what ruined this girl's life? Honesty. What ruined her life for Rolling Stone magazine wasn't that she had sex with a dog. What ruined her life for Rolling Stone magazine was honesty. So when you start to look at this, you, you think we no longer care about the sins, that, well, homosexuality, bestiality, incest, we don't care all that much about these things. And as a result, we're kind of like going, well, what is God so upset about all the time? I don't understand what's bothering him. And I think that's a lot of our problem. And so would you say that the element of your paper where you say we don't hate sin is exactly what you're saying there, is that it's be we become so numb to it that we can't right. understand how God would, oh, how would God judge me? <laughs> right. That that these sins for us are not that big a deal anymore. It's like, you know, come on, let's, why are you getting all upset about this stuff? Why don't you take a chill pill? Uh, uh, here's a quote from professor of psychology, Paul Okami. He says, he's, this is a UCLA professor right now. In other words, he's teaching at UCLA right now. And he says, more to the point, at least some people claim that their childhood sexual experiences with, with adults 
have advanced their sexual self-determination, not overwhelmed them. I've interviewed such people. So what do we do with these claims? And he says, what is the true origin? And, and I have to insert these words. What he means is the true origin of the hatred of pedophilia. He says, I suspect it is multiply determined, but has the Western version probably has the origins in the sexual heritage of St. Paul and St. Augustine, which characterizes sex as dangerous, dirty, sinful, ugly, destructive, and so forth. Wow. Notice here we have a professor of psychology at a major American university saying, I don't think that sex with children is always bad. In fact, I found just the opposite. Sometimes it's good. And so what's the problem? Who is it that's causing us to hate this, to, to have this, this regard of, of pedophilia being so bad? He blames St. Paul and St. Augustine. In other words, everybody, the reason that we're not having more pedophilia in our society is because of Christianity. Think about the significance of that. And so back to your question, Brian, uh, I think this is the, this is absolutely the key point. We have gotten to the point where almost any sin at all doesn't bother us at all. And as a result, because we're so inoculated to the significance of sin, uh, we simply go, I don't understand why God's mad all the time. Why would he order these people that were committing these sins to be exterminated? Well, there's something wrong with humankind in this case. The trouble isn't with God. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of times when the discussion comes to this uh, issue of the judgment on the Canaanites, people will say, well, sort of a twist on the Euthyphro dilemma. You see, whatever God does, uh, even if it's evil, then you can say that it's good. What would you say is that a good response to that sort of typical answer? Well, we, you know, I'm, of course, we're very familiar with that, that typical line of reasoning. It is true that whatever God says is good is good, or whatever God says is evil is evil, but God doesn't make those decisions arbitrarily. In fact, this comes from God's own knowledge and his own nature, because he knows what's good and evil. Uh, to put it into perspective, God is omniscient. If let's well, let me back up. If God is omniscient, if God is omniscient, then then he really does know the end result of all of our sins and how it leads to our ultimate corruption and degradation. And so he is telling us what is right and what is wrong. He's telling us what is good and what is bad, but he doesn't do so arbitrarily. He does so because he knows how these things go. And again, I would point out to everybody, see, they were sacrificing their children to a bullheaded god named Molech. And when I first heard that, I thought, that's impossible. Nobody would really sit, really sacrifice their children to a bullheaded god named Molech. And then I realized, well, we sacrifice our children to the god choice and to the god uh, career and to the god I wanted a boy. What's the difference between the two? I don't think that the, the the abortion that we do today, where we're scalding babies to death with saline abortions, or sucking their arms and legs off, uh, you know, with suction abortions, I, I think you're hard pressed to say that we are any less evil than the Canaanites, especially when just in the United States, the latest statistic is since 1973, we've aborted 50 million babies since 1973. See, we. We love sin here in America. We enjoy it. It's our entertainment. And because it's our entertainment and it's our enjoyment and it's because it makes our life easier, we just think God's mad all the time. Well, the problem isn't with God again. The problem is with us. All right. So we've kind of dealt with some of the Old Testament judgments and things like that. But on the more practical level, when we're talking to others about the problem of evil, it's usually going to be having to do with the personal situation. So how should we talk to others about the problem of evil? How do you discern what the question really is, and how do you go about approaching it on a personal level? Well, I think, you know, obviously we need to pay attention to the individual we're talking to. I think we need to ask him questions, him or her questions. What exactly is going on in your mind? Why are you asking the questions you're asking? What's motivating this? Have you personally suffered, suffered some hurts or losses that's causing you to bring this up. There's nothing wrong with those questions. And anytime you're talking to anybody uh, about apologetic issues, to simply say, so why, you know, are you asking these questions? That, those are fair things to say. They're not only fair, it'll make the, those you're talking to feel like they're being taken seriously. Uh, but for somebody who's just lost a child, as we talked about a little bit earlier, 
I would love them, first off, if they said, you know, I really would like to know what God's big plan is. Well, I'll tell you, my answer to that is God is preparing us, as I said earlier, God is preparing us to reign with him forever and ever and ever. Uh, To put it this way, the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, the first thing that we know about humankind is in Genesis chapter 126. And it says this, for God said, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. Now think about those words for a minute. The creator of the world said, Let's make man in our own image and in our own likeness. And then the next words tell us what that image or likeness is. He says, and let them rule over the birds of the air and over the fish of the sea and over everything that walks upon the ground. So that's the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. And the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, Revelation 22, in fact, the last verse before you get to the epilogue is Revelation 22, 5. And it says, that they and they shall reign forever and ever. Now, the reason I bring this up is because for a lot of people, if they start to understand that we're talking about being prepared for all of eternity with Jesus, all of eternity, that it starts to relegate our sufferings to being rather small. Uh, think about it this way. If you inoculate your child against, let's say, rubella, and the child cries after she gets the shot for five minutes that you have created a certain percentage of suffering. If that child lives to 100, you've created a percentage of suffering that we can actually measure. In fact, I think I did the math, and it's something like 0.000029% of her life you've caused her to suffer out of a 100-year lifespan. Let me change it and put it like this. On the other hand, what is 100 years of suffering? What percent is 100 years of suffering out of eternity? It's 0%. In fact, somebody that inoculates a child against rubella or makes them study, forces them to do homework for one hour out of their 100-year life, has created, in a sense, think this through, infinitely more suffering, infinitely more suffering than 100 years of suffering is out of eternity, because eternity is that large. But I'm afraid, again, we've got to really encourage people to think through the significance of this. How long is eternity? We're going to get to be with each other forever in eternity. And to minimize this and to not take this seriously, to only look at uh, the problem of evil from from this realm, we are completely missing it. All right. Now, speaking to the Christian apologists now, are there general principles Mm -hmm. that someone should keep in mind? I'm thinking about a number of things, say being a good listener, discerning the motive behind a question, knowing what the question really is and being patient, things things of that nature. What sort of principles should the apologist keep in mind when dealing with the hard subject of evil? Well, obviously, of course, first of all, be patient, uh, be loving. Uh, secondly, uh, listen. That's kind of a duh. Yeah, you need to listen to people and hear what they've got to say. Uh, I think another thing is, again, is to study the answers enough so that you have something concrete to say. People in any kind of apologetic discussion get frustrated when they feel like they're losing. And so read up, do some reading, do some thinking, do some praying, especially about things like, well, what's free will about? How valuable is that? Uh, Why, you know, what is eternity about? Is God preparing us for eternity here to really think those things through so that when this comes up, you'll have some solid answers to give to them? Obviously, uh, there, there's the, the trouble with the problem of evil, as John Feinberg points out, is it's not the problem of evil. It's the problems of evil. There's more than one problem. Uh, for instance, just in the big categories, there's natural evil and there's moral evil. Well, those are two really very different problems. Uh, you know, I mean, natural evil like tsunamis and earthquakes and cancer, those are nat- natural evils. And then you've got moral evils like rape and torture and murder. Uh, my, By the way, my argument is, and most I think most Christians would say, natural evil entered our world because of the misuse of free will by Adam and Eve. That's how natural evil entered our world. But then the question there arises, well, wait a minute, how come uh, we're suffering for a sin that Adam and Eve committed? Well, 
The reason for that is, is we are their reproductions. They couldn't, when Adam, after Adam and Eve sinned, they couldn't do something supernatural and produce some, anything other than themselves. They could only reproduce themselves. And here we are, and we've been attending funerals ever since. But again, I say to everyone, look, the point of the matter is, here's our comfort, is the reason God is allowing us to go through this world of death and mourning and crying and pain is so that he could prepare us for eternity so that we'll be fit fit citizens for his kingdom forever and ever. I think that's the emphasis that we need to that, that we need to keep hitting. How would you encourage Christian apologists to approach this whole study? What sort of attitude would should they bring to it and spirit should they minister in? Well, let me end as I began then by quoting D. Martin Lloyd-Jones one more time because I think again he got it exactly right. Most of our troubles are due to the fact that we are guilty of a double failure. We fail on the one hand to realize the depth of sin, and we, on the other hand, if we fail to realize the greatness and the height and the glory of our salvation. And so to apologists that really want to get into this, I'll tell you what I would encourage you to do. You say, man, I really want to get a handle on this. Start reading genocide books and Holocaust books because there's an amazing thing that goes on when you read those books. Listen to me. Every Holocaust researcher I know, and I've read many of them, thinks that we, that it is normal, average individuals that commit genocide and Holocaust and torture each other to death. I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag Archipelago, he spent eight years in the Soviet Gulag himself. He put it this way. Where did this wolf tribe come from among our own people? Is it our own flesh, our own blood? He says it is our own. And just so that no one too quickly takes on the white mantle of the just, let each man ask himself, if my life had turned out differently, might I too have become such an executioner? He says, it's an awful question, or it is an awful when one answers it honestly. Uh, in other words, Solzhenitsyn, uh, not only that, but Elie Wiesel and a host of other Holocaust researchers, victims included, they say, it is the average members of a population who commit genocide. Well, there's something really wrong with humankind, and I think we need to bring this home to people, that that there's something desperately wrong with humankind if we're all Auschwitz-enabled from birth, and we really are. And so I'd really encourage anybody that says, I want to do better in this subject. Start reading Holocaust researchers. I'm going to have an article uh, come out in the next Philosophia Christi, which is going to talk about this. If you get your hands on that article, uh, then then that will give you a lot of who these researchers are and the evidence that they've compiled of this is just what humans do. Humans torture and murder each other to death. That's what they do. To focus in and understand what humankind really is, because once you do, you realize there are no good people. And, and here's my emphasis on this. Once you realize how desperately sinful humankind is, the problem of evil largely goes away because no one ever asks why bad things happen to bad people. Never. Uh, so, and the other thing, again, I really encourage you all to think about, everyone to think about, start thinking through how heaven comes into play to eternity. Meditate on it, read books on it, think it through. The Weight of Glory by C.S. Lewis, I highly recommend another fabulous book on what, what God's doing with heaven. Um, Think this through, because the problem of evil isn't answered by only looking at this life. If if heaven is true, if we're going to live forever and ever and ever, then this life is just a, just a blip on our eternal futures. And so we should take that into consideration. And so I really encourage the two things that I just mentioned. Study the depths of human sin and study the glory that awaits us in heaven, and be prepared to articulate those things to others. And I think that we'll, uh, they'll find that they'll be pretty successful in changing people's minds. Now, Clay, as we wrap up here, I know you are working on uh, a book, but talk about your upcoming article in Philosophia Christi. Yeah, I, the article I'm coming out with, the next one is entitled, Would You Condemn Me to Justify Yourself? Theodicy versus Anthropodicy. The point of the article is that there's a sub subtle tactic that skeptics employ, and the tactic is that they will use as their examples, for the most part, humans that most people will consider innocent or good. 
the point for them then is to say something like that. See, these people haven't done anything at least very bad, and so they don't deserve all the suffering that they're experiencing. That's why skeptics often, by the way, use children who have suffered rape or cancer as their examples, because then they can say these children don't deserve to suffer what they suffer. Therefore, God isn't good or he doesn't exist. But sadly, unfortunately, we're, we're giving a lot of uh, skeptics a free pass because we're not really paying attention to something they're doing. And what they're doing is, is they're doing anthropodicy. I mentioned that theodicy is the justification of God. Anthropodicy is the justification of man. And for people to really attack God for allowing evil, they have to say man isn't as bad or humankind isn't as bad as you make him sound. But strangely enough, uh, not only do we have scripture to bolster our position that humankind is really evil, we also have other lines of evidence that humankind is really evil. Uh, for instance, examples, we have examples of human evil. And this is why I said study genocides and mass murders and, and whatnot. Study crimes against humanity. And you're going to find that that all the Holocaust researchers agree that normal people are doing this. Ordinary people are the ones that commit genocide. Uh, do, there's studies been done on human evil because after the Holocaust, a fellow named Stanley Milgram decided to conduct an experiment. Uh, this was done in France again recently and, I, and even in, in, in the UK where they did an experiment on and televised it uh, on, on shocking people. They'd tell people, OK, give them a shock and the shock would go all the way up to 450 volts and these people would be shocking whom they thought was getting shocks 450 volts even though the person was screaming and begging to be released after the by the way the person who was screaming and begging to be released was really a paid actor and wasn't getting any shocks at all but the person shocking him didn't know that after Stanley Milgram's study in the early 60s, he said he came to this conclusion. He said that Auschwitz could be staffed by the average population of New Haven, Connecticut, uh, that we really need to understand that humans will torture each other and kill each other really very, very easily. Uh, and so and like I say, researchers bear this out. So uh, my article is to point out basically that that there are no good people. And so when people say, well, why do bad things happen to good people? That's not a Christian position right off the bat to say these people are good. Now, it is true that they haven't done anything where people should punish them or torture them with these things. That's true. But that isn't the same thing, though. You can't say that they're good people because they're not good. When Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one's good but God alone. He wasn't passing the time of day. He really did mean there are no good people. When Jesus in the Sermon on the Mountain, Matthew was talking to the crowd, he said, if you then, being evil, would good give good gifts to your children, how much will your heavenly Father give you good gifts? Notice he just, in a nonchalant sort of manner, says, well, you're evil. And if you look at Luke chapter 13, verse 5, you find the same thing. I should say 1 through 5. You'll find Jesus being nonchalant towards how evil humankind is. Anyway, uh, so the article is going through and examining how really the atheist has to do the justification of man, and the theist is doing the justification of God. I think we should do a two-pronged approach. Not only should we point out why God's good reasons, but we should point out that humankind isn't good at all. We're not born good. We're, more, we're born sinful, and that hasn't been given enough attention. Well, Clay, thanks so much for speaking with me today. It's been very insightful, and appreciate your time. A pleasure. Good to be with you, Brian. We've been speaking with Clay Jones, assistant professor at Biola University, part of the Master's of Arts program in apologetics. Uh, be sure to check out his resources that are linked at today's blog post at Apologetics 315. And if you found this podcast helpful, be sure to subscribe in iTunes for more interviews. And I encourage you to leave a positive feedback as well. This is Brian Auten of Apologetics 315, and thanks for listening.